nothing. But since litia can mean both litter, in the sense of that which lines a cat's litter box, or a stable, for example, and in its archaic usage, a portable bed, rather like a sedan chair, the phrase faire litière de connotes a use of the letter that makes of it something one might just as well sit or lie on as shit on. The Aquinas reference, meanwhile, alludes to Aquinas' famously having given up writing following some sort of vision, at which point he wrote in a letter to his secretary, all my words are like chaff to me compared to what I have seen. So Lacan is here playing on a possible misconstruction of his meaning that Joyce's pun fait la lettre in the sense of its having straightforwardly reduced the letter to litter or following his own gleanings from the etymological dictionary reduced litera, written character, culture, instruction to lino, spot, stain thereby making of his own lettering a kind of erasure or deletion a writing out that amounts to a whiting out, if you like, or indeed publishing qua rubbishing of the unconscious as a poubelle. In other words, Lacan is here framing the question that he will not answer for another four years yet as to how Joyce manages through his use of the letter, taking support from it, as one might from the second sense of litière, to achieve something that psychoanalytic practice also aims at namely to trash or erase the letters in the unconscious enveloped within the symptom. Lacan next alludes to a lecture, the text of which has been lost, given during the events of May 68 in Bordeaux, in which he had said, according to his own summary of it, in rather Bichettian terms, civilization is the gutter. As if to account for the provocation, he goes on in the following terms to evoke Beckett for the second and only last time. I quote... I should probably say that I was then weary of the dustbin, poubelle, to which I've riven my fate. We know that I'm not the only one to, as split, admit as much. To admit, to admit or pronounced according to the old convention, to have, of which Beckett fashions a scale for the have-to that trashes our being, saves the honour of literature, and relieves me of the privilege that I apparently believe to hold my place. So textually speaking, there's a great deal going on here. Indeed, there's something of the unreadable about it. But in the most general of terms, Lacan here brings together his theoretical work of the previous three or four years. In saying civilization is the gutter, Lacan reduces civilization to that which fails to contain litter, waste, that which belongs in the bin. Such a statement references what he had theorised in Seminar 17 of the previous year of the Discourse of the Master, which is identified with that of the unconscious. This Discourse of the Master here is framed as the discourse with speech, in the sense that it functions by the superegoic imperative vocal, com vocal command that is the effect of the entry into speech, or what Lacan calls the Master Signifier, or S1. It's the one that functions by the kind of do this, do that, it's the discourse that functions through the creation of symptoms. This is, I can go into this later if you like, but that's how he figures it. This is the discourse of the master. In articulating this as such, Lacan also performatively evokes psychoanalysis itself as the discourse that emerges at a particular historical juncture as the other side or mirror image of the master discourse. It's the one down here. Following this, Lacan goes on in saying that in so saying, he was weary of the poubelle to which he had riven his fate, rhetorically to mimic the discourse of the analysand who enters into analysis by articulating a complaint to an analyst, thus constituting the symptom as symptom through what is known as the demand for analysis, as in this or that is not going too well for me, why help? Indeed, as Lacan himself then says, he would be neither the first nor the last to admit as much, that is, being weary, tired of his own shit, or following the archaic meaning of the French verb avoué, namely to recognise or acknowledge as one lord, one's lord and master, to be as a slave to one's unconscious, thereby becoming split, a split subject. In the French, in the original, um, partage means divide or split. So in that next paragraph, Lacan makes a Joycean equivocation of his own between the verb avouer, to admit or fess up to, and in its archaic pronunciation, avoir, to have, a having of which Beckett makes a weighing scale in which to get the measure, as it were, of the doit or have to that lays waste to our being. 
So here Lacan evokes once again the discourse of the analyst, casting Beckett's writing as a site where having is put to work as a counterweight to the very same kind of speech, parole, evoked back in Seminar 16, that characterises the master's discourse as nothing more than the work of the unconscious, and which instantiates the subject's fading beneath a master signifier, or S1, that stands in for him. That's the subject there. Lastly, Lacan suggests that in so doing, Beckett saves the honour of literature and relieves Lacan of the task, or, following the second interpretation, relieves him as split subject of the privilege, that is primary or master signifier, just as psychoanalysis as clinical practice, at least at this stage in his teaching, seeks to do at its end. Now this last surprise and claim, Beckett saves the honour of literature, must be understood in light of some of Lacan's closing remarks in the seminar of the previous year, where he appears to lament the shamelessness of contemporary civilization and insists that psychoanalysis as clinical practice has a role to play in bringing back shame in the interest of upholding the notion of honour. This apparently scandalously reactionary remark, far from being a straightforward endorsement of the kind of shame one might experience um, upon being caught in the act of some affront to good morals, however, alludes to a shift in contemporary civilization as Lacan sees it. We're in the aftermath of the events of May 68, remember whereby the gaze of the other, which might confer shame upon the subject, is being eclipsed. What this means for Lacan is that these are times where the master signifier, or S1, is no longer being acknowledged as the subject's lord and master, where the subject no longer believes herself to be a split subject, represented by the master signifier, as that which occupies, holds, or secures her place within speech. Consequently, the contemporary subject is one who seldom dies of shame, as he says in the opening to the session, to the extent that she no longer conceives of her life as enthralled to a master as an index of its value, thus depriving her of the kind of noble noble cause for which such a death might appear necessary in defence of honour. Jacques-Alain Miller has articulated the problem that this cultural shift poses for the contemporary psychoanalytic clinic as follows. I quote... It is no doubt a question in the other side of psychoanalysis, that's the name of the seminar, of separating the subject from its master signifier in the analytic operation. But this assumes that he knows he has one and that he respects it. Thus, in suggesting that Beckett has saved the honour of literature, Lacan positions his writing practice as a kind of doing that is like the doing of an analysis, insofar as this latter discourse without speech seeks to separate the subject from his or her master signifier, that is, the oppressive, imperative or vocal command that governs her. So Beckett's writing, according to Lacan, is on the side of the discourse of the analyst, as counterweight to that of the master, to the extent that this writing emulates the analytic process by which the subject is relieved of his or her master signifier, having first acknowledged, of course, that she has one, and having respect for it. Beckett is someone for whom the practice of writing testifies to the singularity of the subject insofar as that subject is determined by his unconscious through the master signifier. Beckett is, in other words, using the letter, even as he might appear to be shitting all over it at times, reducing litera to lino, rather like an analyst does in occupying the position of the objet A in the clinic, which is the position of the turd. Now, this is quite a different claim, then, to the one Lacan makes both of other literary authors and of Joyce. If Beckett is a kind of silent partner to Lacan, it's not just in the most obvious sense that Beckett is someone who is somehow important to Lacan, but about whom he says very little, almost nothing, compared to Joyce. Beckett is Lacan's silent partner in the more specific sense that he functions in the period 1968-71, to as a figure aligned with psychoanalytic discourse, as a discourse without speech, that is the obverse of the discourse of the master. This is all the more significant for the fact that these 